this morning on this beautiful day of worship. If you are a visitor with us this morning, thank you for being here. Your presence is an encouragement to all of us. Um, it is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning so that we can collectively worship and encounter Him. Um, happy Lady Day weekend, too. Uh, speaking of Lady Day weekend, uh, tomorrow the church office is closed uh, due to the holiday, so that's the only uh, and specific announcement that I have this morning, but I believe Jared would like to make some announcements. Sir. Good morning. I won't take a lot of time because we've been running the slide um, every every week just reminding you. But uh, if you were here last week and you um, you were privileged to hear uh, Director Smith uh, from the association uh, deliver our message, what a great announcement. He basically made the announcement for me and the responsibility that we have as a local church to our association, but more importantly as a, um, as a church member and a member of the body of Christ to our local church. And so I hope you've been praying and um, asking God how uh, he can use your talents and your gifts that he's been giving you um, to serve our, our congregation in, in a committee, in a, in a team, um, or as a, as a deacon. So please continue to pray for that. And if there's someone that you, you feel like the Lord is leading to to serve in a particular area, ask them and then nominate them. You have to let Jackie know at the church office about deacon nominations or let Clay or myself know um, um, just when you see us or give us a call anytime. So uh, that's all I've got, Max. Thank you. Isn't it amazing when you <clears throat> meet somebody and they, uh, it, it's common to say, hey, how you doing? I'm doing fine. How are you? I'm doing great. No, we're not. No, we're not. Nobody's doing fine. Nobody's doing great. Everybody is struggling with something. You drive down the road, you go by cars, you buy houses. Every house has heartache, despair, anguish, depression. On and on and on. It doesn't make us liars when we say, oh, well, we're doing fine. Hey, we're doing fine. We're just trying to spare the person from having to sit down with us for several hours and really tell us how to feel. You know, we're kind of, we're good at faking. We're good at putting up the facade. Maybe all of us deserve Academy Awards. I don't know. But the point is, is that everyone hurts. But we have a Savior. And that Savior can ease that burden. Yes, Lord Jesus, we have been faking it. I don't know, as the same goes, maybe we fake it till we make it. But I don't think we ever really make it, Lord, until we're in front of you in eternity. In the interim, we have to live in a broken world, and that broken world means that we're part of it, that we are part of the brokenness. So our problems, our despair, our anger, our anguish, you name it on and on, is just part and parcel of the world that we live in. It's not an issue of right, it's not an issue of fair, it just is what it is. And you know that. You know the pain and suffering of your children. So much so that you provided a way to redeem us to heal us. And so this morning, we do take those worries, cares, um, concerns, and we lay them at your feet. It's not going to make them go away, Lord. It's, it's uh, not going to make everything just all of a sudden, you know, peaches and cream, but we know that your shoulders are, are wide enough. And if we just allow ourselves to do this, to unburden ourselves, it can make our loads so light. 
So we want to give that to you this morning. Lord, we also want to give you praise and glory and honor through our worship because of what you've done for us, because of the sacrifice that you didn't have to make. You did it because you love us. And we, in turn, as your children, want to try to reciprocate that love as closely as you have given it to us if we can within our limited capabilities. But when we fail, um, always come back to you. Because you remain our rock and anchor. Thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. Thank you for allowing us to put our cares on you. Because we know that you have our best interests. And you will attend to those needs Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you on this Labor Day weekend. And I'm going to um, have you stay seated while I read the scripture. And if it helps to close your eyes to listen to the word of God, go to sleep. Then you can try that. Um, this is from Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5 and 8 to 19. So listen to what the Lord has to say to you today through his word. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed by the eagles. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As the Father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed, he remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They course like a flower of the field, the wind blows over it. And it is gone. And its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Would you stand? and sing with us, Jesus paid it all.
things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Amen. Thank you. 
and we, we indwell them, and we see them in others. That's our vocation as Christ's body, is to let the world know that we have been released from the pain and the constrictions of this world. We have been freed by the only one that can free us in Jesus, and so that we live, and we live eternal life. And the church has started a long time ago, never, and it ends never. Because we serve an eternal God who, who created outside of, of this, outside of us. Well, good morning. It's good to be back with you again. God bless you all. We missed you last week, although we had a lot of fun. We had birthdays to celebrate, family coming in from different states, and just really enjoying ourselves. Getting to spend time with each other here at the beach and fishing yesterday. Too many people. Yeah. Ooh. How big were they? Doesn't it come? Come on now. I've got pictures. Okay, he caught them all. We know about Photoshop. We have to post it. <laughs> Happy Labor Day. Where we celebrate people who, who labor, where, where we celebrate people who uh, give themselves. You know, normally you don't go to work to give yourself to yourself. You go to work to give yourself to someone else. Whether it be the fruit of your labor, the fruit of your love and your passion, the fruit of your gifts and arts, the, the fruit of whatever that is, we create, we are creative beings. You know why? Because our creator God is a creative God. Every new leaf that comes in in the spring, every blade of grass that needs to be cut, he created it. You can cut that if you want to. I don't know why. Our Father is a creative God, and he asks us to do the, the same thing. So today, as we anticipate Labor Day tomorrow, resting from our work, resting from our deeds. We, as a vocation, are meant by God. We are constantly perfecting the goodness and the grace of God our Father. Pray with us. Our Father, we thank you so much for bringing us here today, that we were able to come here today, and Father, we were able to lift up our voices to sing to who you are. We are able to come here and we are able to celebrate together, together, that we are Christ followers, that we are Christians, that we understand, Father, that the fact that you would not leave us alone, that you would not be in, in, in your greatness, you created us, you created us for a relationship, mm -hmm. you will not be denied that. Father, we pray that you continue to dwell with us, even though we are not worthy. We pray that you continue to direct us and instruct us, even though we stumble and we fall. Father, you said, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, we believe that. And we want to walk with you. And we want you to guide our lives. And you want us to give us purpose in the things that we do. We don't want to labor in vain. Father, we want to labor because the fruit of our labor in Christ is eternal. And Father, we pray these things in his name this morning. Amen. 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 As we traveled around uh, this last week, I, I noticed people at work. Okay? I noticed people at work. And uh, um, some people handle work a little bit differently. Than they have at other times. Other people don't know how to act. They don't know how to present themselves. Uh, they don't. I mean, you go into a restaurant or something, and and it's just like it's 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 hesitancy. It's difficult. You know, just my heart broke for the people that are trying to serve, that are trying to give their labor because they need a check. I had a guy tell me that one time when I gave him a check on the back of my head at my steel company, and he said, "Hobbs, I don't need that check." He goes, "It's all the people I owe that need that check." Well, we find ourselves in that condition sometimes. We find that we need to be there in the labor force doing the things. And so it's, it's difficult for some people right now to, to put their fingers on things. Things are not as tangible as they used to be. They, they're, they're just kind of, every time you put your hand out on something, things just squirt away. It's difficult. But you know one thing that we can? <laughs> you want to go over this. You know one thing that we can place our faith in and our trust in? The Lord Jesus Christ. And God the Father who created all things and counted it good and said it is good. And so a benevolent God creates things that he chooses to create. He steps back away from things that he allows. He's calling us into a labor that is, that is beautiful and trustworthy and eternal. This morning we're starting a series on Timothy. The young man Timothy who called us Apostle Paul, who we've spoken of many, many times, who he, he, he found him uh, in, as a believer in Lystra or somewhere, I don't remember exactly where it was, I guess that's not a good thing, and, and he formulated inside of him that he, even though he was a timid young man and he was might be bashful, it said that he was a little weak, a little sickly maybe in scripture, that he put inside of him an ability and a faith and a trust in God and 
more impactful faith, a, a, a faith that is effective and pursuant to a, a life of change not only for ourselves but for others. He creates in Timothy a young evangelist, a young teacher, a young preacher, a young man who would step forth in the faith that tradition says is to be in his life as a martyr. So today we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. If you would turn there to God's scriptures today. And I'm titling this series, which is going to last for, 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 for quite a few weeks, Timothy, an example for those who believe. An example for those who believe. I love the fact that, that, that God chose a young man like Timothy, a young man who others would have to listen to. And they, would, they couldn't pay attention. You know, many times in a modern day society, whatever youth is held against you. And you're supposed to be seen and not heard. But God chose this young man to be able to understand, comprehend, digest, and give the truth. And I think that that's astounding. Because it took people listening to him to break some certain traditional hold that they had inside of them of who's right and who's wrong. And so Timothy is being instructed by Paul. He was a young man, he was a son of Judas, and he was a son of a Jewish woman, and he was also the son of a Greek man. And he, I, don't, I don't know much about his father. None of us know much about his father. It's not said much. It's said that he was born of a Jewish mother and a Greek father. And so we know that he was kind of a not fully Jew. statement. 
preserving holy sentence that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Paul says, of whom he was foremost. And in verse 16, it says, and yet for this reason I found mercy. Even though I was a sinner, even though I had fallen, that, that, that I didn't understand things, like God selected me to show himself powerful, Paul is saying. I found mercy in order that in me, as the foremost sinner, as a foremost sinner, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. And it says, jump down to verse 19, it says that keeping faith and a good conscience is what he was expecting from Timothy. Some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered over to Satan so that they may be taught not to blaspheme. I mean, we learn in church, you don't, you know, you don't, you don't name names, do you? And Paul didn't just name names in church. I mean, he wrote them down. Mm-hmm. For us to do that, I don't even know these people. And I go, ooh, who is Alexander and Hunter? Those oh, people, oh, those people, giving my guy Paul and Timothy grief. But what they're saying right here is there's things in this world that don't, that, that if you let yourself become your own, you know, I told y'all here a while back that I read a book called The Death of Expertise. We all become Google experts, and we don't need to listen to those folks because I Googled it. Now I know more about it than they can't possibly know, right? Well, there's people right here that are saying, well, I don't understand this about my doctrine or the doctrine of faith, and so I'll fill in the blank. Well, that's not a healthy thing to do. When you start not understanding something in Scripture and you decide to start filling in the blank, you get all sorts of bizarre things, and we see that since the time of Christ. Till now, we've seen all sorts of religions, we've seen all sorts of faiths, and we've seen all sorts of doctrines brought into the church, brought into some of it's just crazy stuff. But Paul is saying that we need an orthodox faith, and we need an orthodox way of right behavior, orthodoxy and orthopraxy. And, and the only way you can do that is to know what you know. That's my cage analogy. You got to know what you know. Sometimes we don't. And so I'm going to go into verse 5, and I'm going to talk a little bit about verse 5, because it to me is the heart of the matter. Verse 5 says, But the goal of our instruction or our commandments or our teachings or whatever is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. What he's telling Timothy is this. There's all this teaching, the reason we are teaching you and commanding you and giving you an understanding of what the true orthodox thinking is of doctrine, orthodoxy. Well, what, the reason we want to do that is because we want you to love. And if you have love, everything else falls in line. If you have this love, now the Greeks had many words for love. Eros, phileo, benevolent love. That's a love that I want. I want things more for you than you even know for your, want for yourself. It, it's, it's a benevolent love. A, a fidelity. It's, a, it's, a, it's an understanding of that when a, like when a child needs to be kept from danger and you help that child be kept from danger. Child, you can't play with that knife. And the baby cries and you take it away from him and you go, but I love you and you don't understand. And so Paul's saying right here, he's saying, the reason we're giving you these commandments, the reason we're giving the reason we're giving you this teaching is because we want you to have an understanding of true love, agape love, the love that, that is God-like, that God gives to us things that we can't even comprehend. And, and the only way you can have that is to come from it with a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. A pure heart. Pure. Now, how? When, when I read these things, when I first read these things, I said, oh, a pure heart, a good conscience, a sincere faith. These are no no things that I can put inside myself. There's nothing inside of me that wants to have to deal with the things that Paul, Timothy, others had to deal with. They had to deal with stonings and beatings and being ran out of town because they're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
but they love. They are. They were accustomed to living in without knowing where their food was going to come from, without knowing whether their, their boat would be shipwrecked, or, or knowing whether their family would just disagree with them and disown them. They had no idea. But Paul is saying what we're trying to teach you, what we're trying to instruct you, is to have a love for all people. The love that God has for mankind. That kind of love that pours itself out, even though we shun God, even though we, we put him in a box, and even though many people do not believe and disregard, it rains on the just and the unjust alike. But our God rains on this earth and he loves his creation. And he calls us back into a relationship with him. And the reason he does that is because love. Love from a pure heart. That pure heart, that pureness, a purge cleansed, uh, uh, coming from a, 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 a filtered place, you know, a, a, a purity that only can come from God. And the heart, the, the heart they look at as their center of emotions, the center of their affections, the center of their will, the center of, make, I want to do these things. The reason I do these things is because it comes from the center of who I am. We've had friends before that have told us, well, you know, people just have to deal with you. That's who I am. Well, that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is not who I am, but who he is. We're not talking about the, the pure heart of Beryl. <laughs> That's kind of scary, isn't it? No, we're talking about the purity that only God can give us. We're talking about the center of emotions. God tells us over and over in Scripture, he says, I will place my will in your heart. He will give us the, the what does it say? He will give us the desires of our hearts in Scripture? No, it doesn't mean that I want a new whatever. No, he's saying, I'm not going to give I'm going to take the desires of good, a pure heart, and I'm going to place them in your center, in your will, in your affections. And then that way, they will come pouring out of you so that you can have a good conscience, is the next thing it says right there. A good conscience. Who, who's good? Are you good? You good? Nobody's good, it says in Scripture. No, not one. And our goodness is found in the Creator God. He created us. He calls us into a loving relationship with Him. Because I'll be honest with you, outside of Christ, outside of God, outside of the whole the instruction of the Holy Spirit, we really don't even understand what good is. Now, like a blind pig, we'll find an acorn from time to time. I mean, we might do some good things, but the good things are as filthy rags, it says in Scripture. Because if they're not as done for God, then they are as done for whatever. You, you can stumble and fall into a good act. But he's saying, from a pure heart, with a good conscience, the good conscience can only come from God. That goodness that I'm talking about can only come from God, because only God is good. And so the conscience that I have, the, the, the thought process that I have, is, is like a, a, a conscience is, a, is like our morality meter, okay? You know, you know when you're doing something bad, don't you? You know when you're doing something that, I mean, even as a little kid, we knew when we were doing something wrong because we were hiding it. E e even as, a, as an adult, we do things that we don't want anybody else to see because we know deep down somehow that the, the thing that's speaking inside of us, our conscience is telling us that that is not what we should be doing. And so the only place to where we can get a good heart, a, a morality based on God's likeness, is through Christ's likeness. That's how we get a good conscience, is that our conscience is, is able to be purged and to be cleaned and to be cleared because of God the Father, who indwells us through the Holy Spirit, and who says what is good. He teaches us those things that are good. Just as Paul is teaching Timothy, and as Timothy devotes himself to study and to prayer and meditation on who the Lord is, he becomes mature. He becomes that more, that more stable Christ follower. He becomes that person who, when he, when he was 89, 80 years old, 79 or 80 years old, tried to stop a procession at the temple of Diana, at Diana and tried to stop them, their heathen procession, and they beat him and they stoned him and they drove him to death. That's what tradition tells us. From going from a sickly young man who Paul says, chill out, brother. Take a drink of wine. Get in those people. Get in your, your fussing and your moaning and your screaming. You just need to settle down. Somebody who stands in front of a crowd and says, what you're doing is wrong. What you're doing is leading you to a path that's, that's incorrect. And I want to give you the good news 
And I want to give you the great news that you don't have to go to the, that temple up there and do all the acts that they ask you to do and, and buy all the things they tell you to do and, and, and give yourself over to the, 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 the temple prostitutes and the this and the that. And all. You, don't, you don't have to do all that. You can have a freedom, a freedom that allows you to live a life that's just love. And when you, that's the trigger, that's the mechanism, you're living love, and you have nothing else you owe. You have nothing else that you are beholden to. You have nothing else that you have to worry about. You can live in truth and faith with a pure heart and a good conscience. And that conscience is given to you by God. Because the Holy Spirit is truth. The Holy Spirit tells us what he wants us to do, what he wants us to know, how he wants us to believe. And a good conscience, when we have a good conscience also, it means that God has trained us to do the things that he wants us to do. And now, even though we might step on some people's toes, or, or we might disagree with some people about how they're looking at life, or, or what's going on in their life, and we think we want to tell them the good news of Christ because we love them with a love that surpasses what they want and what they think they need, it goes to the fact that we need to know the fact of Jesus Christ. We need to know that you're God. Pure heart, good conscience. That's when true faith. Sincerity. Yeah, Matt, you, you mentioned it earlier. Sometimes sincerity is a hard thing. I love that commercial. I, I love that commercial. It's all in that. And, and I think it's Texas or somebody walks into a, a place in, in New York City. And they go, how are you doing? How are you doing? He goes, well, I'm doing pretty well. How are you doing? I just flown in on a plane. I just left my kids at home. You know, he starts going on like a Texan would talk, right? And they're going, well, we didn't want to hear all that. You know, that, that's sincerity. That, that's somebody who's pouring themselves out. That's somebody who's actually giving you a real answer to how they're doing it. But a sincere faith can only come from God. We ask God to strengthen our faith. We ask God to, and, and how would, okay, how is our faith strengthened? Okay? I, in my life, God has shown himself faithful. In my life, I have prayed to God for say, not my will, but yours. And sometimes I'm, I say, God, I have this has to occur. I know in my spirit, because the Holy Spirit dwells in, I know that you want this done. Let it be so on earth as it is in the heavens. And God made it so. And God has done it over and over and over. And so he is so trustworthy in my, but it's a faith that comes from him. It's not a faith where I was immature or I was searching for the things that I wanted or that I will. No, no. It comes through the maturity of the Holy Spirit and a maturity and a, sanctification, a sanctifying process, a sanctification process where we walk with God and he incrementally shows us the next chapter. You know, if you open a book and you just start reading chapter 14 or something like that, you may go, what? Really? And in our faith, you know, it's somewhat that way when we have a deep, full, comprehensive understanding. What's Paul telling here? We've been instructing you. We've been teaching you. We've been walking with you. We have been helping, encourage you. Uh, people have been probably helping pay his way to, 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 to learn and to grow and to speak the gospel of Jesus Christ in a town like Ephesus. It's a full-time gig being a preacher. It's a full-time gig being a pastor there. Because I'm going to tell you what, he's getting it from so many different directions. We can go back to Acts and we can read what that looked like back in the day when Paul was there. We can go back there to Acts 16, I think. And the place was tough. And he's telling Timothy, he's saying, look, look, you can have sincere faith because it'll come from God. And the only way it'll come from God is to open it to chapter 1. Take the instruction that we've given you, Timothy. Take the instruction that we have given you. Let the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of you illuminate those words so that you can read them on your heart and you can understand what God wants from you. And so that you can follow him all the way from chapter 1 to the end of the book and he will walk you progressively through it, letting you understand all things, opening up all mysteries so that you are no longer dumbfounded when somebody asks you a question about your faith. You are no longer stumped when somebody says, well, does it say in the Bible such and such and such and such? Well, 
was sick and cute and Jesus Christ. When the devil, after he was tempted for 40 days, when the devil came to Jesus and he said, you know, he, he asked him certain things. There are three things, three temptations of Christ. And how did Christ answer him each time? On the, from the Bible. The word of God. Because the word, the law box, the minute together thought process of God was written down for you and I. And guess who was there to see it done? Jesus the Christ. The Messiah. And he knew the word, law box, the word, written word. Now he knew, he knew the word of God. I used to say that word daily. And he followed it hard after. So that he could take his life into a different place. That God could take him and mold him. Get his labor that wouldn't be in vain. That every day he would go down and flip a burger. And he would, you know, design a, 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 a this. Or he would um, teach a child this or whatever. All these things are good and necessary in our life. But I'm going to tell you the reason that you do it. And that's why it makes all labor good. Is that God is involved in it. God is in the middle of it when you are a Christ follower. And so that no matter what your labor is, that you do not labor in vain. Because the umbrella that is covering over you is the umbrella of God the Father. The salvation of Jesus Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit who guides us to become the people that he can trust, that he can infuse, that he can teach, and he can have us give the word of God. Timothy is that example. Timothy is the one that we're going to be studying on. Timothy, this young man who went from a, a child, a, a position as, as a child, understanding and learning the word of God and the tell the scripture, to somebody who literally laid his life down. Not so he can say, I'm a martyr. He laid himself down. The people that killed him were the ones that he was loving. And he was trying to teach them and instruct them because of love and to show them that the God who created all things wants something different. And it's because he loved them that they took his life. Sounds like the life of Jesus Christ. Sounds like the life that he calls you and I to. To lay ourselves down mercifully before the world who is dying and doesn't understand. The, the world that, that doesn't want to fill its time with worrying about what scripture says or what God wants or any of those things. No, the world wants what the world wants. But God wants something completely different. And, and he showed us, this young man, Timothy, who, who undoubtedly then, going from a young man uh, and, and an understanding of the faith and becoming an, an evangelist, a, 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 a preacher of the word, a, a liver of, the, of somebody who lived the faith, I doubt seriously he made much money. But I guarantee you, you and I are reading words that were written to him some several thousand years. made that seed that Paul planted come to fruition and to come to fruit. And the, the, the fruit that he bore inside, not this fruitless discussion that we talked about in verse 6 where people just hop around and they, they're straying from these things and they turn aside and they talk about fruitless, they have fruitless discussions. There's some people that really don't make a hit, do they? They don't. But that's what God's trying to tell us here. Look at Timothy. Look at somebody who is an example of someone who believes. Look at the work that Christ did inside of him and that we read about even today that he accomplished. That's what we're reading with. I'm going to close. In verse 4, it says, Some pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. I'm going to leave you with that. And I'm going to tell you that. Look, we can pay attention to all sorts of things in this world. There's people vying for your attention constantly. You won't drive from this church to your home without seeing something to deal with wanting to get your attention. Wanting to sell you something, wanting you to believe something, wanting to turn on the radio, what somebody tells you on there. You know, there's no place that you're going to go in this world where you're not going to try to be told to go to good. And I'm going to tell you right now, the only place that you can find the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so don't count me. He's got the Eureka Pass on. He, he holds the key. And he holds it with us. And he offers it to us. And he says, live by this. Live by the 
stand and one of my favorites, Chain Breaker. And he is a God who breaks every chain.
this week, give me a call. You know my number. If you don't know my number, call the church. They'll give you my number. If there's anything that I can do for you, by all means. God has given me his grace, his mercy, and I just need to, I just need to continue to pour it out freely. Freely he has given, freely we receive, freely we give out. True? Yes. God bless you all. Have a great week. Love you all in Christ. Enjoy your Labor Day weekend. Be safe. Be careful. Love you. Thank you.